Uh, so tonight, the first speaker is Professor Penny King, um, and she is going to talk about the exciting news heading to Mars. Mars has been the, all over the news recently for good reasons, which is always nice, uh, and she's going to dive in to about what she does and also uh, what's so exciting about it. Uh, so Professor Penny King is at the Research School of Earth Sciences here at ANU, and I will hand it over to her. You just have to unmute. Thank you. Thanks, Brad, for the lovely introduction. Um, as Brad mentioned, I'm at the Research School of Earth Sciences, so that's uh, down near the centre of Canberra. Um, but what I like to do is, is get away when it's not in shutdown and um, look at rocks. And I look at volcanic rocks from eruptions. I go to um, salt lakes and look at the rocks there. And then I have spent some time being part of the um, team that's looking at rocks on Mars. So this is part of the Curiosity rover. Here's the instrument that I helped calibrate and sent to Mars. And um, I also go up into Arnhem Land and work with um, the traditional owners on rock art. So I do a range of different things. Today I'm going to talk to you though about Mars and exciting things that we have been learning about the red planet, our neighbour. So here's the Curiosity rover in the Namib um, sand dune and you can see that um, it hasn't got stuck. In fact, this rover has been going for eight years, a few weeks ago, and so it's amazing. It's a um, very resilient little rover. On its trips, it's collected a whole lot of views of Mars. And so I'm going to just show you some of them. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a geologist. I like rocks. I like sand dunes too. More sand and rocks. There's a lot of sand and rocks on Mars. Great for a geologist. Very thin atmosphere on Mars. And then this is an impact crater. So there's different processes that occur on Mars more frequently than they occur on Earth. It's also very cold, about minus 60 degrees centigrade average. The radiation is strong, not a good place to hang out really. Um, it's actually quite inhospitable. But I just showed you that we had spent a fair amount of time with rovers on the surface of Mars. And here are the tracks of the Curiosity rover coming off that sand dune. And um, it seems you might wonder, why do we go to Mars when it looks so inhospitable and rocky and cold and has very little atmosphere? So why do we do that? Well, the first reason is that humans just love to explore. We've been doing it for um, thousands of years. And as Brad mentioned, the Australian Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders have um, been some of the first explorers. Here I'm showing some of the song lines or path trade routes that they used um, as documented in the 1930s. But they have been using those trade routes for tens of thousands of years. So exploring on Earth and in the oceans is something that we as humans have been drawn to do. But as most of you love astronomy, the sky has also held our fascination. And here are some examples from other parts of the world, um, star charts from Egypt and also from China. And we continue to explore. And as you know, one of the places that we explore are the planets nearby. This is the launch of the Curiosity rover in 2011. And um, here I am with my family watching for the countdown. That rocket went really fast. It was there one minute, seemed to hover in the sky. And then 20 minutes later, it was over Australia. So if you want fast transport, take a rocket. Ma 
stars could be confused for some of the places that we have on Earth. So here are some photos of places I've been and you can see that they have a sort of Mars-like quality. Rocks, dry, red, not very hospitable looking. But Mars is more like home than any of the other destinations nearby in our solar system. So here's a sort of list of targets that NASA has been considering to visit, to look for um, how the solar system has evolved and changed over time. And so you can see Mercury and Venus, Earth and Mars. Mars is the most similar to Earth. Here are some moons. They're very icy, not quite as similar to Earth. So because Mars is so similar to Earth, people have wondered, does it hold the answer to this question that we've thought about for millennia? Are we alone? Now, this has been the topic of many books, movies. You've probably seen some of them. Here I am with E.T. in Hollywood. It's the real E.T. E.T., one of the first famous extraterrestrials. Is E.T. what we're looking for? Or what kind of life should we be looking for? Well, there's one option, which is a live life. And then the other option, you can guess, dead life or extinct life. So which kind do you think we should be looking for? It's actually both. So that's, that is, um, we, we kind of doubt that we'll find a live life, but we'd be happy if we did. We're, we're thinking that it's more likely that we'll find extinct life. So the kind of life that most scientists are looking for is very small. We're not talking about dinosaurs or ET. We're talking about microbes. And microbes are one hundredth the size of a normal piece of hair. So if you feel your hair and think about how small one hundredth of that would be, that's the size of a microbe. Microbes are important because they are were the first um, kinds of life on earth and the simplest and they're now really abundant and so they're a good target for looking for life elsewhere. The first microbes on earth were found in really old rocks. So rocks that are older than two and a half billion years old and you can see Australia has quite a few of those kinds of rocks particularly in Western Australia. Now Earth doesn't have as many of those really old rocks as Mars does. On Mars, here, these orange rocks are shown, and those are more than 3.7 billion years old. So scientists think that Mars would be a really good place to go and explore for early life because it has a lot of rocks that formed at the time that life was forming on Earth. So it's a bit hard to search for microbes, as you might imagine, because they're so small. And so scientists have decided that the easiest way to look for microbes is actually to look for um, the kinds of environments that microbes might like to live in. And so NASA has had a strategy for many decades now of following the water. And the Mars Exploration Program has relied on looking for water on Mars. Interestingly, Indigenous people in Australia have known for years that water is essential for life. Here's some Wanjina rock art from the Barnet River in Western Australia, and the Wanjina spirits, shown beautifully here in this rock art, were cloud and rain spirits, and they created the landscapes and continue to have influence over the landscape and the inhabitants. So we're looking for water, but I showed you a whole lot of pictures and those pictures didn't really have any water in them.
And so why are we going from Earth with lots of water to this dry planet that, as I explained before, is, is not very hospitable for life? It's dry, thin atmosphere, very, very cold. The sun's radiation and cosmic rays hit the surface of the planet and there's lots of dust and rocks and probably limited life, if any. Well, the reason that um, scientists go there is that we believe that there used to be water on the surface of Mars in the past. And so if we look at the oldest areas of Mars, and so those are the heavily cratered areas in orange that I showed you before. So yes, Mars is older than Earth over, oh, in terms of it has more rocks that are old. It's not actually older than Earth. They both formed at the same time, but there's more old rocks. I'm just answering a question I see online. Um, so if we look at those old, old rocks, we see things that look like streams. So on Earth, we have streams will connect up. Little streams will all lead into bigger rivers like this. And we see things that look like lakes with streams coming out of them into big depressions that are thought to also have been lakes. So Mars does have a little water today. It has it in ice at the poles, so this dark blue is ice. And then it has water bound up in the rocks in the light blue here. So that's in types of minerals uh, called clays and sulfate minerals. So you have those in your garden. There are gullies on Mars in some of the craters, and this is um, Newton Crater. And that's been monitored over the years. And hopefully you can see that going downhill, the surface is changing over time. There's been a lot of argument about these observations. Some people think it's water, other people think it's just dust going downhill. Anyway, there's multiple lines of evidence suggesting that there may have been water on Mars in the past. So that has been enough evidence to send a bunch of rovers to Mars. And so this one's been eight years on the surface, the Curiosity rover. And what it's been doing is trying to look for a place on the Mars Martian surface that would be a potential place for life in the past or present. And as soon as we got there, pretty much, within the first few weeks, a stream was confirmed on the surface. This is confirmed by looking at rocks and seeing these little round pebbles. Can you see them up here in this top right corner? And you can only make little round pebbles like that by moving them in a fast moving fluid like water. So um, this would be water like the water in a river on Earth. We then traveled around within the first few months and found rocks that had funny little spots in them that geologists think form through the process of water trickling through the rock. And so these rocks made the scientists on the team very excited because this was a place that we wanted to go and look at carefully with all the tools on the rover to see if these rocks could have um, hosted life or even have traces of life in them. So that is in fact what we did. We went and drilled these rocks with the rover. So here's an example of a drill hole on Mars. This is the first drilling site. So we did a little test drill hole, not very deep, because this was the first time the drill had been used on Mars and then did a deeper drill hole here. Can you notice something strange? The rock's red over here, but what's being drilled is grey. I'm just going to leave that with you for a while to think about. 
Okay, so when the geologists went here, we were looking for a few things. Was it a good environment? And the answer was yes, because we found clays, like you have in your clay garden if you live in Canberra, or um, clay you might have used for modelling at in class. Um, not very much salt, which is good for microbes, and not very acidic, which is also good for microbes. A chemical energy gradient. Well, remember I mentioned this grey versus orange? That's actually a chemical weathering gradient. The grey rock has been oxidised or rusted to make it orange. And so there's a chemical energy gradient, sometimes it's called a redox or oxidation gradient between the grey and the red. And microbes use that chemical energy to survive. Um, is there protection from radiation? Remember I said it's pretty horrible radiation. Well, not really, but it's probably the best we've ever seen on Mars, had, had seen on Mars at that point because it was a drilled rock. And so um, there was, we were burrowing down inside the rocks. Uh, was there organic material? So microbes are made of organic material. So if we find, found organic material, we might be able to say something about whether there were microbes there. So even though these rocks were drilled in 2012, this work wasn't done for six years because it had to be done so incredibly carefully. So molecules on Earth are in microbes and include um, a whole range of different potential molecules. Now on Mars, there's radiation and the oxidation, the rusting. So we probably wouldn't expect these molecules. These are some traces showing molecules here that were found. And these are very simple molecules, not complicated like these ones. And suggest that it, there probably aren't microbes on Mars and if they, there were, they've been extremely degraded. So our best guess at the moment is that we haven't actually found and measured life in these organic molecules. It's probably from meteorites. But um, the exciting thing is we found an environment that could um, sustain life and where where microbes could live. So what's next? Well on the 30th of July, so a few weeks ago, um, the Perseverance rover shown here on the right, which is kind of a twin of the Curiosity rover, took off on an eight month, uh, six month trip to Mars. So we're in a good at a good time right now and we're quite close to the orbit of Mars so that's why this mission went now. Perseverance is going to a, another crater. It's called Jezero Crater. This is topography map. And it's going to investigate this area here, shown in these very strange colours, um, that are thought to represent what's called a delta. So a delta is where a river comes out into a lake and fills a lake. And as it does that, material is deposited on the floor of the lake, building up sticky clay. And that sticky clay ends up having microbes stick to it. And as you go into the lake, you get more and more microbes. So here in this picture, we see that this shape is like this. So we'd expect the rivers coming down here and... Um, we have, oh, can you see my, I hope you can see my mouse. Anyway, the river is coming down here and we can see um, these rocks out here and we'd expect them to be, um, have more microbes in them if there are microbes there out on these edges. So that's what the exploration plan is. The edges are full of clay, 
this special kind of clay called smectite and it's shown here in blue and that's where we expect to have lots of microbes so the, the perseverance rover is going to go to this area and is going to investigate these areas that are rich in smectite or clay and it's going to do that with a whole lot of instruments radars and lasers and weather stations cameras a spectrometer that measures UV light, another one that measures x-rays, and it's going to have a bunch of microphones too. Now my favourite part of the rover is this cool little um, aircraft that's going to launch from the rover's body. It's called Ingenuity and it has a little rotor here, so it's kind of like a helicopter. It goes flying in the sky and then here it has two camera eyes and it's going to be looking down and trying to help the Perseverance rover figure out where it should go. The other part that I really, really like on this rover is that it's going to collect samples. So it has a really big head here. This is bigger than a lawnmower on the end of an um, arm that's about the length of a lawnmower. And it has drills on the ends of that arm that are going to drill into the rock. And the cool thing about those drills is that they're able to actually create cores of rock. So they're like cylinders of rock. So here on the left is an example, the bottom left of a core of rock. And then it's going to put it in this sleeve and store that rock inside the sleeve in this container. And this container is called a cache. And then eventually, in a few years' time, the aim is to go collect that cache and bring those samples back to Earth so we can look at them. Now, the idea of, of looking at the rock cores is that the rock cores might have materials in them that have been protected from radiation. And radiation, as I mentioned, isn't very good for preserving molecules and it destroys them. And so we're hoping that by looking at cores, we have a better chance of finding microbes in those clay or smectite rich rocks. So there's two Australians on this mission. Um, Abby Orwood is from Brisbane. She works at JPL and she's um, in charge of the X-ray spectrometer. And then on the right, David Flannery works in Brisbane at Queensland University of Technology. And here he is um, last year measuring rocks out in the Western Australia, some of those really old rocks and using the drill that they um, were using, that they're using on the rover. So there's some Australians involved in this mission, which is really exciting. So if you'd like to learn more, um, you can go to mars.nasa.gov and find out more about these exciting missions and upcoming results. So thank you. There are lots of questions here and I think I'll just have to scroll back So someone says, I understand exploring and curiosity. Why would we want to imagine life on the moon or Mars or another planet when we can't take care of this planet? I actually wonder that myself sometimes. Um, I think that they're different goals. So caring for our planet is something that everybody should be doing. Um, but that doesn't mean that we, we can't listen to music that we can't do art, that we can't explore. It just means that it's one of the things that we do. And it turns out that exploring on other planets um, gives us some options of things to learn about and uh, that, that may end up helping us take care of our planet. Um, it also turns out a lot of the money that we spend on going to other planets is spent on people's salaries and people developing new things. And so um, 
sometimes those new things are helpful for us in our day-to-day -day lives as well. So I think we should be doing both. I don't think it's and or. I don't think that we, we have to have a choice between exploring planets and taking care of our Earth. I think we should always be taking care of our Earth and that we can choose to look at planets too. Um, Venus is very hot for this kind of exploration. And so Venus, unlike Mars, is a over 350 degrees on the surface and so it's and it's got very very thick atmosphere in clouds and so um, we think that it would be quite hard for life to survive on Venus and that it's more likely to be found on Mars Mars might have underground volcanoes. That's true. Um, Mars might have underground volcanoes. In fact, it might have something called lava tubes. So this is when um, lava comes out of a volcano and a crust forms on the surface of the lava as it's flowing along. And that crust um, then insulates the hot lava inside that can still keep th flowing, th flowing through that um, tube or that crust. And so then the um, volcano ends up being underground. People think that that might be a, a reasonable place to go looking for life because the, the crust of the volcanic rock would have shielded um, any life from the radiation. Okay, those sand dunes really look like some of ours on Earth. Are they similar to what we have on Earth? And yes and no. The gravity is different on Mars and the atmosphere is thinner. And so the, um, the wind doesn't move material as much as it does on Earth because the atmosphere is thinner. Um, so they, yes, they're similar but we, all, we do have to make corrections for the different properties of the, the surface and atmosphere of Mars. Um, can we live on Mars? Not right now. And the reason we can't live on Mars is because we don't have enough resources on the planet to live there. And so um, we would have to figure out some way to make water for a start and protect ourselves from the radiation as well and keep warm. All of those things are really quite hard to do without fuel, but fuel is really heavy. And so it's actually quite hard to take fuel to Mars that's enough to do those kinds of things. So, when can I visit Mars? Well, I think we have to solve some of those things first. And I think that bringing back samples from Mars will help us because it will tell us what's there and then what resources are there in a real way. So we've sent these rovers and that's great, but it's all remote. So can you imagine sending a camera to the bottom of the ocean? You could take photos, look around, but it's just not as good as you going yourself, right? Well, it's the same with these rocks. You really want your rocks to come back to you so that you can um, look at them and multiple people can look at them, check them out, and then everyone can decide what's there. When you send the remote camera or the rover to Mars, you can't really have that fact checking and multiple people looking at things because you only have um, one way of getting the information. It's like sending the camera, it's just one way of getting the information. But if you bring back what you see on the ocean floor, then everyone can look at it on the ship. Same with Mars, if we bring back the samples, everyone can look at them and then we can come up with better ideas as to what's there. So we can come up with better ideas about what kind of um, radiation protection might we need? 
are the are those rocks and minerals toxic all of those kinds of questions we can answer with samples that have been returned from mars wow there's so many questions here what got me into looking at rocks ah that's interesting so i i just liked being outside and i've never heard about looking at rocks actually i didn't know that people did that um and a family friend said to me when they heard what i was going to study at university penny why are you doing that i was going to do arts and they said you'll end up just filing papers in an office somewhere and i thought oh no that's the last thing i want to do i want to be outside and so she said oh why don't you do geology or geography and so i decided to do geology and i decided that rocks were actually pretty cool um are there any other sites like the one that perseverance is going to explore yes there is um uh, th there are actually quite a few sites like that um, because there are a lot of craters on mars and lots of evidence for that old water so yes there are other sites like that what will happen if extinct life is found on another planet hmm so if extinct life is found on another planet there'll be people that say yes i believe that and there'll be people that say no i don't and there'll be people that the scientists saying we need to test that and so i think it's going to be ambiguous if people if we find evidence for extinct life on another planet i think that the scientists will say we need to test that again and that we need to then check out um, what's going on with multiple techniques so i think that's the first thing that's going to happen but i think it'd be very very interesting um why is there no water on mars you know i'm actually working on that right now and we don't have a very good idea the main ideas are that it had a atmosphere early in its life that had water in it and it was that the planet couldn't hold on to that atmosphere very well because it's not very big and so gravity didn't hold that atmosphere to the planet and the hydrogen escaped now that said there is water in the ice at the poles so there's not no water because there's water in ice but there's no liquid water so i might have um, said that wrong by accident earlier but yeah there's no liquid water and it's liquid water that you need for life can we make a rover from an rc car and a gopro what is an rc car i wish that someone could answer me because I don't know what an RC car is, sorry. Remote control car. Ah, okay. Probably could, yep. Now, the problem with your rover is it would work on Earth, but it wouldn't work on Mars. Now, the reason it wouldn't work on Mars is that Mars is so cold that our normal electronics that we're used to don't work very well on Mars. So you have to use special electronics that can survive temperatures that go from minus 120 at night up to 25 or 30 degrees during the day. And so if you had a remote control car and a GoPro that had parts in them that could um, stand up to the temperature cycling, yeah, you could. Um, Am I interested in Europa at all? Is it being explored too? Yeah, I love Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter and it's got an icy crust. And then it has an ocean that isn't like our ocean with normal salt in it. 
it's an ocean with um, Epsom salts in it. So you might have seen Epsom salts for the bath. So there's Epsom salts in the ocean of Europa and then there's bicarbonate soda. So that's what you use in the kitchen when you're cooking. So Europa is super cool. We're not quite sure why it's like what, it, uh, what how it's how it's become the way it is, but there are some um, plans for exploring Europa in a lot more detail. So you can go to the NASA website and learn about that. Okay, so how do these machines engineered to pick up rock cores? get tested on Earth before they start their journey to Mars. So what they do is like that, this picture here. This is um, David Flannery and he has actually got the drill bits, this here under his piece of um, whatever that is, piece of paper, is one of the drill bits, like the drill bit that they're going to use on the rover. And so he's drilling into some rocks that are kind of like the hardness of the rocks on Mars to check it out and test. Then what they do is they, they put those onto the rover and they test it on the, on the rover itself. Sometimes they have a twin rover that they do testing on too. But they have to do, I mentioned earlier, they have this horrible like temperature fluctuation and then they have lots of radiation too. So they usually do some testing in a cold chamber. They do a testing in a shaking chamber, uh, a vibration chamber, and they make sure that the parts work before and afterwards. And they, it, you know, it takes, it takes more than 10 years for most of these missions to get ready. And so they spend a long time testing. So I hope you enjoyed that and um, Looking forward to seeing this stargazing, even though it's virtual stargazing. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, and Mars will feature a bit tonight in our virtual stargazing. Um, now, it is a bit uh, cloudy here in Canberra. Um, we're fighting back rain and as I said, clouds and all sorts of things. And it's been like that for a week. Great for the, cloud, or great for the trees and plants, obviously, not so great for us looking up, but a sacrifice we're all willing to take. Um, so I'll talk about a few things that you can, you can see uh, in the skies tonight if it's clear where you are, uh, or maybe later this weekend uh, or into early next week. And so if you go outside now, um, right around 7.30, um, and if you look towards the east, you'll see pretty high in the sky two bright objects. Uh, and these two objects are Jupiter and Saturn. So, uh, Sometimes you may see a really bright object and you don't know if it's a star or a planet. Now, there's actually two simple tricks to determine uh, if an object in the sky is a planet or a star. So firstly, uh, planets don't twinkle. So you may, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Uh, you may have seen stars twinkling and flickering light, slightly changing colors and all those sorts of things. But planets don't do that. So why? Why don't planets twinkle? Well, it's quite interesting, and that is, it's a bit to do with our eyes, actually. Our eyes in the Earth's atmosphere. So as points of light come into our Earth's atmosphere, there's turbulence in our sky. So the same reason your airplane shake is the same reason stars twinkle. And so as that light comes down, turbulence bounces around, and we see that flickering, we see that twinkling. But planets, planets have multiple points of light, so they're closer to us, therefore brighter, and therefore, we see multiple points of light coming into the sky. So our eye kind of averages that twinkling together. We don't necessarily see it uh, as this twinkling. We see it just as a solid point of light. Now, if you look through a telescope, you can actually see a bit of the, the planet moving and shaking. You know, we don't see twinkling of the sun or, or the moon. That's because it's super bright. So firstly, if it's really bright and it's not twinkling, probably a good chance it's a planet. Now, the other trick is planets form what we call an imaginary line across the sky we call the ecliptic. So imagine our solar system is this giant disk, this giant plate. And we're looking through the edge of the plate. And so if you look through the edge of the plate, 
all the planets will line up on this arc going across the sky. And it's essentially the same path the moon and the sun, for the most part, follows across the sky. So if you kind of know where the sun rises and sets, and where it relatively goes, where it roughly goes across the sky, anything that's bright and not twinkling appearing on that line will be a planet. So in fact, tonight, and, and, and it's been like this for a couple months, and it'll be like this through the end of the year, so it's not like you have to worry about and rush out to see it just tonight. You have plenty of time. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are really close to each other in the sky, and they form what looks like a pretty straight line going down, and it follows all the way down to the horizon where the sun rises uh, in the morning. So if you're going out right now or go out tomorrow night, you'll see Jupiter and Saturn. And, and Saturn uh, is always spectacular to look through a telescope. So this was an image I took uh, a bit a while ago. So uh, knowing we weren't going to get anything this week, um, uh, but Saturn luckily doesn't change too much night to night, which is always fantastic. And you can clearly see the body of Jup uh, Saturn rather, and the beautiful rings of Saturn. Uh, and you can see the gaps. You can literally see the gaps or what we call the, the division between the body of the planet uh, and the main ring system of Saturn. And you can really see this through a telescope, the telescopes that we use for our public nights at Mount Shrumlo. If you have a pretty good pair of binoculars, you can start to see that Saturn is not round or circular, that it's kind of weirdly shaped, and that's the rings. So it's really amazing, I think, to to see Saturn because it's like it appears, right? Saturn is exactly as promised, which is always a good thing that you want in your planet. Now, the other thing, Jupiter. Now, if you have a pair of binoculars, you can go do this. So just for reference again, uh, Jupiter is the top object here. Saturn's the bottom one. So Jupiter is a bit brighter, and it's going to be on top or further west, depending on uh, the time of night, uh, relative to Saturn. And if you look at Jupiter, you'll see Jupiter. And if you have a telescope, you can start to see these two main gas bands of Jupiter. But even through a, a relatively fine pair of binoculars, you'll see Jupiter, and you'll see the four dots around it. And in fact, Penny mentioned in her questions about Europa, and Europa is one of those four what we call Galilean moons, the four biggest moons of Jupiter. And through a pair of binoculars, you can actually see them. So if you look at Jupiter right now, now imagine this is actually tilted, you'll see one, two, three dots on the top, and a fourth dot on the bottom. And if you actually look at Jupiter every night, say you want to take a look, yeah, it's a clear night, and next week will actually be very clear, nice and cold and clear here in Canberra, um, we'll see these moons change over the sky. So in fact, you'll see that these dots aren't in their same position night to night, and that is actually because they're orbiting around Jupiter. In fact, this is one of the key pieces of evidence that Galileo used to show that the Earth was not the center of the solar system in the universe, along with another thing that I'll mention in a second. So great chance to see the, the moons of Jupiter in action just by using a pair of binoculars and looking at that bright object. Uh, someone's asked, what do we use to stargaze? Uh, these, these images were taken through an 8-inch telescope. So when we talk about telescopes, uh, it's the size of the telescope mirror that matters, how big the mirror is. So telescopes are just giant light buckets. So if your eye was eight inches wide, you would see the same thing effectively as that we can see through this telescope. So just by using a simple camera, on the back of this, we can see Saturn quite well. Uh, and this is exactly what it's taking. If you have a telescope that's four inches, you can also still see the rings of Saturn. You can clearly make out the, ring, uh, the moons of Jupiter and some of the details of Jupiter as well, especially if we have a nice clear night, which unfortunately isn't tonight. Now, if, if you're a late person, you like to stay up a little bit late, at 11 o'clock, you can actually start to see Mars. Uh, so, you know, Penny uh, talked a lot about Mars, um, and uh, you can start to see it as it comes over the eastern horizon just after 11 o'clock. And so by the time 11 o'clock comes up, you'll see Mars low in the east, and Jupiter and Saturn will be nearly straight above you. And Mars looks red in the sky. Uh, you know, Penny showed all those beautiful pictures uh, of Mars. We call it the red planet. It looks red, and it looks red in the sky. Just as on Mars, Earth looks blue in the sky, um, we see Mars as the red dot. And if you have a telescope, you can see Mars as a redder dot, um, you can start to start to see some detail on Mars 
through a telescope about the size of eight inches. Uh, so next month, we'll probably take a closer look at Mars as it'll be rising a little bit earlier. And so Mars is visible all the way um, from about 11 p.m. all the way until sunrise. So Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, uh, if you're an early riser, will all still be up then. Um, someone has asked, uh, how many uh, moons does Jupiter have? Jupiter has 79 moons. It used to have 62, um, and then it, uh, 17 more were found about two, in 2018. So it's at 79 moons. But it doesn't have the most moons. Uh, in fact, Saturn has the most moons at 82 moons. So Saturn has 82, Jupiter has 79. Uh, they're a bit overachievers when we compare to Earth, which has only one. Luckily, we're not Mercury and Venus, which have zero. Um, even Mars has two, even though they're tiny. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. But with Jupiter, you can only see really the four big moons of Jupiter, uh, those Galilean moons, as we said. On Saturn, Saturn's largest moon, Titan, you can see a bit of size uh, uh, to Titan on a clear night. It is possible, but really the rest of the moons of Saturn are quite tiny and really embedded in that ring system. Now, there's obviously some other things to see in the nighttime sky that are always great that I love to look at. Uh, so we have here the Southern Cross. Um, and the, the trick to the Southern Cross is two things. Uh, some stars you may see, um, they may look like the Southern Cross. So how do you know what the Southern Cross is? Well, we use the trick called the pointers, and that is these two bright stars, what we call Alpha and Beta Centauri, point to the Southern Cross. So if you see something that looks like the Southern Cross, and you see two bright stars to the left of it, or to the bottom, depending on the time of day, or time of night, rather, these, this will be the Southern Cross. And also, the Southern Cross, by its name, is in the south. So if you know where south is, and you look towards the south, the Southern Cross will be in the southern sky. It won't be in any other direction. So it's always a trick to finding the Southern Cross. But above, kind of in this triangle between Alpha Centauri, what's sometimes is called Rigel Centaurus, and the top of the cross, there's this triangle. And if you look on a clear night, so you kind of need a moonless night, um, so the moon is quite young right now, you'll see what looks like a star, but that star is actually a faint fuzzy object. And through a telescope, you can see it's actually what we call a globular cluster, in this case, Omega Centauri. And Omega Centauri is a ball of stars grouped together where gravity is being held onto it, and it's being pulled together, uh, and it's being uh, tightly bound. And we think this is actually the remnant core of a galaxy. So we think Omega Centauri used to be a galaxy that gravity ripped apart, threw around, and kind of spat out. And this is just the leftover bits of it. So it's a great chance to see tons of stars, literally millions of stars in this little ball. And again, you can see this even through a telescope about the size uh, of, of eight inches. Uh, someone's asked, um, how did Saturn's rings form and how did they keep their shape? So if you notice, Saturn's rings form a ring. Where our solar system is a disk, our Milky Way is a disk. Things in space like to spin around. And as they spin around, we, what we call conservation of angular momentum. So imagine... I have all these things spinning, and a couple of them collide. Well, they're going to bounce off in the same direction, and gravity is going to pull them together. So now you have a few things like this. A few more of them bounce, so you get more spinning. And as you get more gravity, gravity pulls the rest of the things together. So the universe, that like the natural spinning shape, is things in a disk, which then eventually, if you get enough of them, turn into a ball. It's this really elegant process using the principles of physics that show how the, the fabric of everything, galaxies, stars, planets, moons, rings, all come together. Uh, so I think it's a very beautiful thing that we get to see uh, in our universe. Now, if, if you're an early riser, let's say you like to wake up the dog um, and take a, a walk with him uh, or, you know, get some fresh air, you can check out Orion in the early morning sky and Venus. If you're up in the early morning Venus is what we call the morning star, bright in the eastern horizon. And if you look through Venus through a pair of binoculars, a telescope, it also has phases just like the moon. And before I end, I just want to point out a really cool thing happening next weekend. And you may have seen this a couple weeks ago, and that is the moon, Jupiter, and Saturn all lining up as a trio. So on the 28th of August in the early evening, you'll see the moon, Jupiter, and Saturn all in a perfect line. 
Now, because the moon moves differently through the sky than Jupiter and Saturn on the 29th, again in the early evening, the moon will kind of be in between Jupiter and Saturn with the 30th kind of the other part of the line at the end. So next weekend, go outside, and you can see this any time after sunset, and see kind of a really cool space trio in line. Uh, now, it will happen again in September. In fact, uh, it will happen a couple months until the end of the, uh, the year uh, when we don't see this anymore. So lots of things to see in the sky this week and this weekend. Um, and uh, go outside. Hopefully it's clear, not too cloudy, uh, and you can see some awesome things. Now... Our next speaker, uh, I'm going to hand it over, is uh, Professor Kate Reynolds. And Professor Kate Reynolds is in the Research School of Psychology, uh, and she works on groups uh, and group dynamics. So how do, uh, how do groups function? How do groups work? The processes, the relations. And so she's going to talk about something I think is really cool, uh, and that is space psychology uh, and how we use psychology um, to prevent, as she's calling it, space mutiny. How do we get people to Mars? A lot of people have asked in Penny's talk, what about sending people to Mars? Well, it's pretty tricky. And Kate's going to talk about one of the really big tricks of sending humans to Mars. And I think that is the human part and what she and her students and colleagues are working on to solve that. So Kate, if you're ready, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Ed, thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and it's great that you can join us for uh, stargazing. I'm just trying to share my screen, which should be straightforward. It doesn't seem to be seeing my screen. Okay, well, I'm going to talk you through this with, um, with limited visuals, I think, uh, because it doesn't want to recognize. Let me just check something. Hmm, okay. Well, I'm gonna look at my, uh, my slides and you're gonna get to look at me. So I did want to start by just spending a little bit of time talking about the title here, Mutiny in Space, Team Risks and Opportunities for Space Flight Missions. And mutiny is really an example where people uh, don't obey someone in authority and decide to do things differently. And it's a sign that there's disagreement or that teams aren't working so well um, together. And I wanna talk a little bit today about the role of psychology and the importance of, I guess, the opposite of mutiny, which is team cohesion uh, for space flight missions. But I did want to just spend a little bit of time, give you about 30 seconds or so, uh, to think about how you um, might be able to uh, work out why psychology is important for space missions. So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds starting now to think about how is psychology relevant to space flight missions. Okay, so maybe you've had a chance to discuss and think about that question. We know that uh, some of the things that you might have thought about were loneliness, that obviously that astronauts in space uh, can feel lonely and they can feel like they are missing out on things back on Earth. And so loneliness is one of the things that they need to struggle with. Psychology is uh, sort of also relevant um, in space missions uh, because uh, it's possible that uh, because of sleep de deprivation and stress uh, that people can experience mental health problems in space. And it's also true that in space, our brains, um, the way we process information, the way we think uh, doesn't work as well in space. We're much slower in terms of our 
our cognitive function and the way in which we think and respond. Uh, and so that can uh, take a lot of getting used to uh, when we're we, we, when we're talking to ast astronauts uh, that are in, in space. We also um, know that psychology is important uh, when it comes to team functioning, the way in which we might select astronauts to go on space missions, the training that they will have on space missions, and also how they function together uh, as a team on space missions. So all of those things mean that different areas of psychology, uh, uh, sort of clinical psychology, cognitive psychology, uh, social psychology and organisational psychology are all relevant to, um, to what happens in space. I'm just going to see if I can email my slides uh, to Brad because he might be able to, um, to help here. So we know that psychology is relevant for all of those kind of reasons and, and as a result NASA uh, has um, quite a lot of interest in uh, psychology and the way in which teams function in space. Uh, they've spent some time thinking about um, different types of missions uh, and the impact that psychology uh, might have. We also know that there's been some events in the history with NASA uh, that have led to more attention on um, psychological factors. Uh, and one of those uh, events happened in, um, 19, in 1973 and 74 on the Skylab mission, which was the sort of space um, station prior to the International Space Station. And uh, what happened on that mission is that the three astronauts on board uh, felt that uh, they were being overworked, they had too much to do, people were being uh, too demanding in terms of the schedule that they had, and so they decided effectively to go on strike and turned off their equipment uh, for a day and decided to have a bit of a holiday. I'm sure many of us have felt like that when we've been at work or at school, uh, and here is a case where um, the astronauts took a very high risk action and turned off all communications with mission control. Mm -hmm. And this really shows that there is um, an example of conflict between the teams, the team that's in space and mission control as a team that uh, is responsible um, in terms of mission success. And it shows um, us that things can go wrong in space and there could be some quite serious consequences. After this time, NASA spent a lot, uh, focused a lot more on some of the issues to do with uh, team cohesion and team conflict uh, and spent uh, sort of more time thinking about some, what some of the team risks uh, might be in terms of uh, these um, space flight missions. NASA has now identified a whole range of areas where it perceives there to be uh, different kinds of risks. And one of those is to do with cooperation, coordination and communication and psychosocial adaption. So all of those aspects of psychology uh, that we have talked about already. Uh, and NASA has done some work thinking about what kind of missions are likely to produce the most challenges uh, for teams of astronauts in space, but also the relationship between uh, astronauts in space and mission control and how those groups are gonna work together to have a successful mission. NASA recognizes that the longer that humans spend uh, on space missions uh, and the larger the groupings of people that might go to space, the more likely it is that these issues of team cooperation, coordination and communication uh, are going to be a problem. And so uh, they're putting more effort and energy into understanding what are the cycles that teams go through when they're trying to um, act together well to perform a task. Uh, and to think about what some of the threats might be uh, to a team that might lead it to engage in more uh, conflict. 
they also want to spend some time working out how to measure team functioning. So if you're on earth in mission control and you have, you're working with the team uh, and you're um, trying to work with that team so it's successful, what are the things that you might be looking for that tell you that, um, that the team's not working? How might uh, people on earth and perhaps uh, fellow crew members uh, in uh, space uh, know whether the team is functioning well or not. And so we need better measurement um, to assess team functioning. There's also this question of if the team's not going so well, uh, we need to know how to introduce different, um, what's called countermeasures or different ways in which it might be possible to help the astronauts in space uh, to function better as a team. And so um, these countermeasures, what kind of training could people do? What kind of support could they get in space? Um, how might they be prepared before they even leave Earth to be able to function effectively? And when we've got more people going to space, not only more missions, there's a mission planned in 2024 uh, to go to the moon, to spend a longer period of time on the moon, and then to and then to um, hopefully move on to Mars. Uh, there's not only those kind of missions, there's also this idea of uh, space tourism, uh, where you can imagine in the future, people might go on a holiday uh, with a whole lot of other people and uh, travel around the moon and back to earth. And team functioning may also be important uh, in that setting. So we have some slides here. Thanks, Brad. So we're just, um, we almost had some slides. So there's the example of, there are the astronauts uh, uh, with mutiny in space who had uh, issues on Skylab 4. This is the example of, of NASA's thinking about the likelihood of something happening and the consequences of something happening. Uh, and you can see that as missions get longer, um, there you can see sort of yellow versus uh, red. So yellow means that there's medium risk, red means that there's high risk. Uh, and, you know, as we are traveling uh, for longer, uh, the risks to do with cooperation, coordination and communication increase. And if you just go to the next slide, you can see, and you can go to NASA's webpage and you can see all of the types of gaps in knowledge that NASA thinks exist in relation to uh, team functioning. And at ANU and with uh, Grace Goodman, uh, Brad Tucker and uh, Emma Tucker, we're looking at investigating uh, some of these gaps and we've done some research already, in particular looking at gaps one, two and three. So if we go to um, the next slide, we can talk a little bit about how we study and how we prepare uh, teams for space. And we're really looking at trying to um, recruit not only the right individuals, but also the right groups. So even though we might have uh, individuals that have the right characteristics and skills and knowledge, um, the right approach to uh, cohesion and working with others, putting all of those individuals together doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have the right team. Uh, so perhaps we need to do more than just focus on the individuals. We need to be able to really work very well with teams and to actually select the best teams to travel in space. When we study um, teams, so how do we go about selecting them? How do we go about working with them? How do we go about studying them? There are a range of uh, techniques. Um, what's been happening uh, probably up until very recently is that a number of times a day, uh, teams uh, that are working together, that are preparing uh, to go to space, or if we're studying teams um, in other environments, which we're gonna talk about soon, sometimes there are environments that are created to be just like it would be like traveling to or uh, being on another planet. Uh, small habitats, 
delayed communications, um, different tasks that people have to complete. Uh, in those uh, habitats, um, members will have to complete surveys. Um, this is an example. This is the NASA uh, Human Experimentation Research Analog. So it um, has been used to test teams for up to 45 days. There's sound effects in there, it vibrates, there's communication delays to mirror the kind of experiences that teams would have traveling um, and being located, for example, on Mars. And so when we're studying teams in these environments, we would ask surveys, but increasingly we're being able to use technology in new ways to study these teams. Uh, and there is this idea that um, just the size of a mobile phone, people could wear that around uh, their necks and it could monitor the type of interaction that one member of the team is having with another. It could measure um, the mood perhaps by looking at facial expression and also the way in which people are talking to one another. These monitors could also assess sleep deprivation um, and general health of the astronaut. So technology is helping us monitor health, but also could be used to help us monitor uh, team functioning. So these, um, these new technologies um, are, are really um, starting to be studied very seriously uh, and giving us new ways to study uh, groups in space. So this is um, in Houston Johnson Space Center, but there's some other um, images here of other sites that are used to study teams uh, to try and um, mimic the kind of experiences that astronauts would have in space. Uh, sometimes um, the European Space Agency, for example, will study um, teams in high pressured confined environments uh, such as um, this CAVES training simulation, simulation so people can be sent to unfamiliar areas and the way in which they solve problems, respond to stress, respond to space, uh, sort of ch restricted space can be studied and examined. Uh, there's also the winter over crew, I think is the next slide. Um, of course, in Antarctica, there are um, teams uh, that are at sort of research stations there. Uh, that are con uh, sort of their communications is restricted. They're in an, a more extreme environment over winter. And so at ANU and, um, and in partnership actually with the European Space Agency, we've studied uh, how those teams function over time, over winter, uh, to better understand uh, what it might be like for teams who are um, astronaut teams or for space flight missions. Uh, there are some other examples here as well, Brad. There's, um, um, uh, this is another example of uh, Mars 500, which uh, was located in Russia. And here they studied teams um, over 520 days. So the teams are in this uh, sort of confined space, this habitat. It was a culturally diverse team with Russians and Chinese, French and Italians. And they were studying uh, aspects of mental health, stress, sleep, uh, and how people were responding um, during this time. And again, they had communication delays like you would experience if you, for example, were on Mars, simulated landings, simulated Mars walks uh, to see how the team uh, sort of functioned. So I'm just going to have a quick look at these questions just to see if there's anything sort of relevant to um, relevant to where we are now. Okay, I can come back to some of those questions uh, towards the end. So we can go to the next slide, which I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on. So this is data that comes out of the Mars uh, 500 study. And this is the kind of data that would be able to inform um, the astronauts themselves and mission control about the way in which a team is functioning. So, so on the y-axis, you have the score of the different individuals uh, that were part of this uh, Mars 500 mission. 
And across the x-axis, across the bottom, you have the number of days uh, that the mission, uh, that was part of the mission. So um, we can see how every individual, A, B, C, D, E, uh, sorry, yeah, E and F, are the individuals who are part of this mission. And we can see how they're responding to these psychological uh, and organisational really measures across time. So you can see that at point zero, um, many of these individuals are starting um, at a similar point, but they're all reacting a little bit differently as you look at their scores across time. So you can see in relation to depression, this is the, um, so I've got a mouse here I can use. This is the, oh, Brad, you'd have to use the mouse, sorry. Um, the, um, you can see that individual E is suffering much more from depression uh, than the other individuals that are part of this team. Uh, and, you know, that is likely to have implications for, for not only that individual, uh, but the team as well. So if something like that happened, uh, on a journey to Mars, what might E be able to do uh, to help them sort of better cope um, with this onset of this mental health sort of issue? You can see when it comes to the third one along, confusion and bewilderment, that uh, as the mission gets longer, there are individuals who are having more challenges uh, with some of that cognitive functioning, the idea that the way we process information and think, um, you know, might be affected by being in these confined spaces for a long period of time. You can also see how they're react reacting to stress, exhaustion, how tired they are. Uh, but getting this kind of information quickly back to mission control um, and being able to have confidence in this information that relates to how the team is functioning means that it's possible to perhaps intervene earlier or put countermeasures into place that are going to help the team uh, function better. Um, we also know from some of the monitors, there's some work being done at um, Michigan State University uh, with monitors, and they can see that people are spending less time with one another um, the longer a mission goes on. So it, also it was the case here that people are sleeping for longer or s isolating themselves from others longer as the mission goes on. So this is the kind of information that we can get and we're working very hard as our other sort of teams and groups around the world to get a very high quality data uh, about the way in which teams are functioning because it is so critical to a successful uh, mission and successful performance uh, for, um, you know, for spaceflight missions uh, and getting to Mars. So there's also a few other sort of slides here, I think, just um, this is another site. Um, they've all got the same sort of look about them, haven't they? They're all trying to mimic the kind of size of spacing that would be available um, uh, with a mission uh, to Mars the way in which we could get resources and what could we get to Mars. Um, and, and often they're going to be very small and people have to learn to live with one another well in those places. Um, this is in Hawaii. This is in um, Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. There are research teams interested in geology, which is what Penny uh, talked about, um, and also interested in how groups and teams are functioning in you know, applying and going to this site almost all year round, um, doing different kinds of research and studies uh, that um, will help provide information for us getting to Mars. Um, there's also talk about a site here in Australia. Um, and if we had an analog site they're called, because they're meant to be an analog to what it would be like in Mars, um, we would be able to uh, perhaps do more research here and build on some of the expertise that we have in Australia um, to get a better handle on all sorts of aspects of, um, of a mission. Uh, but obviously myself and others at ANU would be very interested in uh, better understanding some of the team functioning uh, and the successful um, indicators that are going to tell us that the team is going well. 
And I just wanted to finish with our with sort of where the research is going. I don't know how many of you are familiar with sort of Star Trek Voyager and the idea that members of the crew are wearing a disc um, that can uh, capture and, com and they can use to communicate with one another. Um, you know, we, uh, we would, and their work is moving towards this idea of a smart monitor that might be able to assess sleep and stress, mood, how much contact people are having with one another uh, by looking at facial expressions, the type of emotion that uh, might be characterising those interactions. It's also possible without looking at what people are saying to understand how they're saying it to get a sense of whether people are getting on well or not, how are they relating to the to leaders uh, in in these particular missions, and this kind of technology I think will help us um, better understand team functioning in isolated, confined, and extreme environments, ice environments, uh, better inform the preparation of teams for a successful space mission. Um, help us better understand what other what things are important for team cohesion. Help us train teams better, but also develop uh, countermeasures for a very successful um, a successful mission, really, and a high performing team that can achieve the goals that they have. So that's really the direction that the research is is taking. So they were the main points that I wanted to make. And thank you, Brad, for getting these slides up. I'm sure they're um, helpful visuals to kind of see the kind of points that we're making here. So let me have a look at some of uh, the questions that we have. Um, uh, one question is, wasn't psychology included in planning for space missions before? I think um, certainly um, after sort of uh, the Skylab incidents, I think psychology and team um, aspects and uh, thinking about astronauts um, working lives and um, their, how, much cho how much they're able to play a role in deciding what they do and when they do it. All of that really came about um, after some of those events. I think psychology has always been there for recruitment, for trying to work out um, who's going to have the right character, skills, knowledge, um, to be able to be successful in um, the NASA type program. So I think psychology has been there um, in those aspects. Um, I think it's more recently that issues of team, you know, scientific understanding of team functioning, how we measure team functioning uh, is, is coming to the fore more recently. What criteria is NASA looking for for the perfect astronaut psychologically? Well, um, a whole lot of um, sort of characteristics or personality characteristics uh, have been identified. Um, often that's about the individual, uh, but increasingly this idea of having a cooperative mindset. So this ability uh, to get on well with others and to handle uh, sort of stress uh, have emerged as being important in terms of what well, more important, I guess, or we've got better information about those things as being important uh, for the missions. Uh, so it's not, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot you have to be able to do. You have to have skills to obviously, um, you know, understand the equipment, fly, um, complete all the tasks that you need to do on such a space mission. But in addition, some of these uh, team aspects are also emerging as important. Um, you mentioned that in space our cognitive abilities are more limited. What causes this? Um, ongoing, ongoing investigation. Um, we know that uh, some of it is to do with the way sort of fluid moves around the body uh, as a function of being in a gravity or a no gravity environment. Uh, but certainly um, if, so, yeah, coordination, finger movements, all of those things are much uh, slower. Um, and also this idea that sort of it might feel like um, the way our thinking um, is going is much slower in space as well, perhaps due to this fluid, the way fluid responds and doesn't respond um, in an, a lower gravity environment. 
So what sort of countermeasures do they use? Um, well, uh, well, it's interesting. So some of the countermeasures, for example, with isolation um, have been, um, you know, have been trying to encourage, helping people to connect with uh, with people on earth. So when it's possible uh, to communicate, those forms of connection are an important sort of countermeasure. Um, making sure that astronauts have time um, to uh, sort of on their own um, uh, to sort of think and relax. That is seen to be another kind of countermeasure to deal with some of the issues of uh, stress and sleep. Um, there are, you know, ideas now that in fact you could set up um, remote training modules that uh, astronauts could do where they've got sort of high quality information um, while traveling in space that would help with some of the time that they they have it at hand um, that they could have um, sort of mental health um, sort of training insights that they could access they could also access um, team type information that might be helpful and the more information they got about how their own team is functioning in real time perhaps um, the more they could perhaps do things that might uh, prevent uh, more serious uh, elements of team conflict so um, knowing how to resolve conflict um, and deal with these stressful situations could be very helpful. So, um, yeah, so this is a very hard question. What actions uh, would be taken if there was a serious dysfunction within a team? Uh, murder, suicide to prevent a failure of a mission, um, particularly if said, if the said individual was key to the success of the mission and survival of the other team members. Um, so you can see that at its most crisis point, um, there are some very complex issues to do with the way individuals and teams are functioning. Um, one of the solutions is to have what's called a leader full team where everyone is capable um, of leading the team uh, such that if something happens to one individual who might be critical uh, to the mission, uh, other people can step in and fulfill that role. So having some duplication or overlap of skills and abilities uh, could be quite important for mission success. Um, but you, looking at that Mars 520 data, I mean, you can see that, I mean, that wasn't in space, it was in a simulated environment, but something about being in that confined environment, something about team relations, perhaps something about isolation, loneliness, um, certainly did lead that one individual to experience more and more depression as the mission went on. Um, perhaps monitoring that would mean that, you know, it might be possible um, to provide um, some sort of counselling and support to prevent things um, deteriorating or getting worse. Um, okay, so there's some other very interesting charts and it seemed there's a couple of people who perform relatively better than others. Um, yeah, so if we um, knew more about how people, if we knew that, if we had lots of teams in lots of analog environments and we were studying them, uh, we would be able to better work out what combination of people um, might be, work very effectively together. So this is all pointing to um, more team research. Um, how do we get more women into space? Um, so, and would Skylab mutiny be due to a change from a military base to a scientific base thinking of NASA? Um, are more women in space? I mean, I think there's, um, there are, um, there are many women who've been to space and there obviously uh, is um, an, well, not just an interest, a real commitment to um, having diverse teams in space um, that includes women. There's certain advantages to women going to space um, in terms of uh, in terms of their size and weight and being in confined type spaces. Um, so I think that there's lots of programs 
uh, working very hard to ensure that women are in the best position uh, to travel in space. Um, yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, this idea of the mutiny, one of the explanations, and I've got a reference list um, that I can share, but um, one of the ideas around the mutiny was exactly that, that the astronaut was almost seen to be like a piece of equipment. Um, and so this mutiny example led NASA to start to think a lot more as um, astronauts, as being sort of very um, valuable members of the team, um, that they actually needed to be sort of included more in terms of decision-making and planning. Uh, and so there was a shift in this idea that um, the thinking about the crew kind of changed as a function of this exam, this event of mutiny. So we've got a little bit longer. Um, I'll just do one or two more questions. What can be done about dysfunction, depression or psychotic behaviour while in space? I mean, this is a very real question, um, perhaps particularly when we think about space tourism. Uh, and, you know, there are questions about whether the medicines that we might take on Earth um, actually work in space. So we, there's some research that needs to be done there. Um, and um, we don't know about the medication. Um, we certainly um, need to think about treatments, uh, including uh, counselling uh, and other interventions that could prevent mental health issues getting worse. Um, so there's another question here. Any chance of deaf people going in space? Would it be problematic? Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. I can't think of any, if there's methods of communication and abilities to communicate effectively, both within the team and with mission control, um, I can't see why being deaf would prevent people going to space. So are there, I think we're pretty much at time. I hope um, you found some of these questions interesting and the human factors, I guess, are a really important part of the puzzle as well in terms of um, having successful space missions. So thank you.